all you can. Save all you can. Give all you can. As a long-term strategy for your money and for your wealth, I think that's a pretty good one. And it comes from John Wesley, whose brother was Charles Wesley. They were the founders of the Methodist movement, but uh, they did have some good things to say. <laughs> and it comes from a sermon in the 1700s called The Uses of Money. And when I was a young man, somebody gave me that advice and gave me the percentages. Earn all you can, but live on 80% of it. Save all you can. 10%. Give all you can. The other 10%. So, I've been trying to do that all along, the whole way. Some periods of my life, the balance wasn't quite right. There, there was a time when we had two kids in college for several years, two of the three. And so, during those years, the balance wasn't 80-10-10. Just we couldn't do it. But we tried to catch up further along the line. And at other times, we've gotten the balance out of whack, but we tried to do what we could and then get back to it. It's been a pretty good strategy all along the way. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Now, you know what's not on that list? Spend all you can. <laughs> Interestingly, Jesus has a lot to say about our earning and our spending. We're doing this sermon series called Jesus on Money, and we're going to talk about earning today, earning and spending, and saving next week, and then giving the week after, and then that'll be it for this series. But Jesus had something to say about our earning and our spending, and he does so in our scripture reading for day, today in this parable and what happens before. Jesus is teaching a large group of people, and the picture I had to show at this point was Jesus and a bunch of people and Jesus is sitting down, teaching them. And the reason I like that picture is because in the first century, and even nowadays, when a rabbi teaches, the rabbi would sit down, not stand behind a pulpit, not stand in front of a, a blackboard and lecture. It wasn't a proclamation. He would sit down to communicate that this is a conversation. This is a conversation between the scriptures and me, and you. So Jesus taught sitting down. So he's sitting down teaching the people, and a guy interrupts him. And he says, Rabbi, teacher, Rabbi, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. It's a family dispute. Somebody has died. There's probably the father. There's some estate, and one of the brothers, probably the older brother, how many of you are, older, are the older sibling in the family? I am not, but probably the older brother is taking his time with the inheritance, making a decision. And so the younger one has come to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, you know, fix this for me. Jesus won't do it. Jesus will not be triangled. According to family systems theory, when any two people in a group, like a family, have a conflict or get uncomfortable with one another, the natural tendency is for each side to try to bring somebody else into the dispute, to take their side. This is ammunition against the other person. It's amazing how many times 
This happens in families. It's amazing how many times this happens in groups of people. It's called triangling. Jesus won't buy into it. Jesus doesn't jump into the middle. Jesus doesn't take a side. Instead, Jesus addresses the larger issue, which is what we don't do. When we're in these kind of conflicts, we rarely talk about the real issue. But Jesus does. And what he says is, be on your guard. Watch out. For greed. Because life is not about the possession of things. The word that The actual Greek word for greed is pleonexia. And I much prefer that word than greed. Greed sounds like a character flaw. You know, it sounds like something terrible within us. But pleonexia sounds like a disease. (laughs) Sounds like a condition or something that we catch. But he's really saying here is, watch out for pleonexia. And of course, he's not just talking about the younger brother. He's making a statement about the human condition. He's making a statement about all people everywhere. There's something about us. We're all suffering from pleonexia. And pleonexia is the insatiable desire for more. We just keep wanting more. And then he tells a story about somebody with pleonexia. There's a rich person, and he has a bumper crop. I mean, it all comes in. Now, Jesus doesn't say anything negative about this person being wealthy. This person is a landowner. This person is running a business. He has hired people. He has invested in seed and cultivation. And now it's all paying off and the crop is coming in. Jesus has nothing to say, nothing negative to say about having wealth, about wanting a future, about having a business, about making money, about making a profit. Nothing. This story he's going to tell is not a story about how this person becomes wealthy. It's a story about what this person thinks of his wealth. Earn all you can. There's nothing wrong with being productive in this world. There's nothing wrong with making things happen. There's nothing wrong with being ambitious and having drive and wanting to accomplish something, earn all you can. Now, John Wesley in his sermon had some cautions about that. He said that, yeah, earn all you can. Use your your God-given capabilities to their fullest, but don't earn in such a way that it causes damage to your body or your heart or your soul, and don't earn in such a way that it causes damage to anyone else's body, or their heart, or their soul. He's saying, earn all you can, but do it fairly and justly, and with honesty and integrity. And it's not just about you, but pay attention to other people too. Earn all you can, but Don't kill yourself in the process. And don't hurt other people either. So the guy has this bumper crop. And he starts to think. This is very interesting in this parable because Jesus tells us what's going on in this this wealthy person's mind. This internal conversation. What should I do? Oh, I'm... I'll tear down my barns and I'll build larger barns. 
and I'll store it all in there. And then I'll be in a position to eat. Relax, it says. I'll be in a position to relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Here's the problem. Kenneth Bailey is a New Testament scholar who spent his whole career in the Middle East. And instead of studying the text and different manuscripts and the languages, he went to the indigenous people in the Middle East, Bedouins and peasants and other people who would have had some continuity with the time of Jesus even now. And he would ask these people, what does this parable mean to you? What does this story mean to you? And it would be like getting a reflection from the time of Jesus. And they would tell him about this parable and say this, oh, how sad this is. This is a sad story because this wealthy person is only talking to himself. Where's his family? Where's his neighbors? Where's his community? He's only talking to himself. This is an egocentric conversation. He's only listening to himself. He has a bumper crop and he's not thinking at all about what he can do with it in terms of other people and how he can be generous and what other lives he can impact or even expand the business and employ more people or invest in other businesses or nothing. What's his interest? Relax. Eat. Drink. And be merry. All he wants is to retire early and have a good time. He's a fool. He's a fool because he thinks that life will be complete if he just has enough to retire early. He's a fool. Because he's bought into the idea that if I can just get it all in bigger barns, I'm going to feel fulfilled. He's a fool. Because he's left God out of his plans for the future. He hasn't included the God factor in this at all. He's a fool. Because he's accepted that the purpose of human life, the purpose of his life, is to accumulate and amass. The next line in the parable is this. Jesus continues the story and says, and God told him. It isn't that often that God shows up and directly speaks to people in Jesus' stories, but apparently this guy is so thick-headed, so determined, God tells him. Next two words are, you fool. This very night, your life is demanded of you. The guy was planning for the future. He thought he'd have this forever. He thought he had enough to go on for years and years and years. And he didn't realize that his life was not his own. He didn't realize that his life was on loan from God. He didn't realize that God was calling in the loan that very night. And all these plans, look what you've prepared for. What's going to happen now? Your life is demanded 
from you tonight. So at this point in the sermon, I was going to show you a painting. And I was going to take about seven or eight minutes to talk about it. I usually go through the images fairly quickly because we all live in an age where images pass for and, you know, gives movement and all that kind of stuff. But this painting really grabbed me and I I wanted to show it to you and and talk about it in length because it's done by an American artist. It's a contemporary painting and, and the painting is huge. And on this side of it, there's the actual parable the parable we're talking about, the parable of the rich fool. And then on this side of it, there's uh, sort of the answer, sort of the the alternative to it. And then around the whole thing is a monochromatic, all in the same color, uh, border. And it has all kinds of stuff in it, all the kind of stuff we love, like it has a cell phone and a stereo system and a new car and... Uh, an expensive pizza, and, you know, it has all this around, all this stuff we pay attention to. And it, it just makes a dramatic statement. You, you look at the side with the parable, and it's a two-story house. And you look in the window, and here's a great big dining table, and there's a work of art behind it that's exquisite, and a chandelier that's shining light down. And there's a man that looks a lot like me and it looks like he's my age and he's wearing a tie and he's, you know, he, you can tell he's eaten well and he's sitting at the table <laughs> and he's all by himself. And then you look next to the dining room and here's the living room and the, the living room has art all over it and there's this sculpture in the, in the living room and it, it's I, uh, uh, a big character but there's a hole in his heart and it's empty. And then this guy has upstairs, and upstairs he has a bedroom, and it's a king bed. And it, it adjusts. And, it, you know, yes. And, you know, it, he has everything. He's got everything. And he's got nothing. And then next door, there's a smaller house. And you look in that house, and there's a smaller dining room table, and it's just a regular light coming down, and there's no artwork in it. But it's a family around a dinner table. I think there's two parents and four kids, and you look outside the house, and there's a bicycle and a doll, and you know they left the toys outside. Come in for dinner now, and they all came in, and they're in a circle. And some of them are holding hands. It looks like they're saying grace. And when you see a circle, it symbolizes God. Because a circle has no beginning, no ending, and that's like God. And a circle is complete, and that's like God. And they don't have much. But they have everything. And I love that painting because it shows you the contrast. And then you look at all these things that are around. And they're, they're things that I've shopped for on the internet. There's things I've looked at Costco for. I love Costco. And you know, if Costco doesn't have it, I don't need it. But <laughs> if Costco has it, I think I need it. And I think of the time I spend looking and wanting and desiring and I think if I get it it's going to do something for me and maybe you're like that and we buy in to the big lie of our time if we get what we want we'll feel like we want to If we just spend the money, which you get this message 4,000 times a day, if you just spend the money on this thing, you won't have a hole. If you just spend the money on this thing, 
you're going to feel complete or different or on the right track or like you're somebody. The whole point of this parable is that we don't realize what money can do and what money can't do. Money can do wonderful things. We can provide for our families. Important thing, we got to do it. It can make our lives more comfortable. Of course, let's be comfortable and let's enjoy living. It can give us a little sense of security, just a little. And we should have that. We need to be responsible and mature, plan ahead. But it can't do some things. It won't make us feel fulfilled. It won't make us feel complete. It won't make us feel like we're worth everything. It won't make us feel like we're the center of the universe. It won't make us feel successful, at least not entirely. And what it really won't do is take God's place in our life. We have the whole until God fills it. And we can't believe the lie that if we just get the right things, we won't have the whole. So Jesus concludes the parable by saying what really matters, what really counts is for people like you and me to be rich toward God. And what does that mean? It means the second home the people God has given you to love. And it means getting out of that house too and sharing with the rest of the world.